Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to see you all here today and my honor to introduce our luncheon speaker. Admiral Harry Harris is a career naval aviator who was commanded at all operational levels and prior to assuming his current command of the Pacific Command, he commanded VP-46, Patrol and Reconnaissance Wing 1, Joint Task Force Guantanamo, Sixth Fleet and Striking Support Forces NATO, and the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Admiral Harris is an operator's operator who has served in every geographic combatant command region and participated in these major operations, the Achille Loro, the Gulf of Sidra, Libra, Libya, 1986, the reflagged tanker operations, Operation Ernest Will in 87, 88 in the Gulf, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Southern Watch, Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom, and the Colombian Hostage Rescue in 2006, 2007. Additionally, he served in Odyssey Dawn, Libya in 2011, where he also served as the Joint Force Maritime Component Commander. Ashore, he served in many important positions, including assistant to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, where he served as the Chairman's direct representative to the Secretary of State and served on the roadmap as roadmap monitor for the Middle East peace process. In the Pacific, he coined the phrase, Great Wall of Sand. Admiral Harris assumed command of U.S. Pacific Command on May 27, 2015. We're very honored to have him as our keynote luncheon speaker. Let's give a big hand to Admiral Harris. So let's give it up one more time for the awardees who were mentioned earlier today. <clears throat> Thanks, Pete, for that generous introduction. I know you took a lot of risk by inviting me back to speak here, almost as much risk as I took being introduced by a service warfare officer. You see, most speakers use the moment uh, before they're being introduced as a final opportunity to prepare themselves to face their audience. One last prayer, maybe, but not me. I listen very carefully to how I'm introduced. To my point, Benjamin Franklin once concluded an introduction of the second president by saying that John Adams was, quote, always an honest man, often a wise one, but sometimes absolutely out of his mind, unquote. So I'm worried that if I don't pay close attention, I'll take the podium after an introduction like that and say thanks, Pete, for that generous introduction. So as I look across this room, I can't help but think there's more brain power in this one space, except for that memorable day last year at Fort Meade when Mike Rogers had lunch by himself. <laughs> so before I get started, let me recognize a few folks. Uh, I was going to recognize uh, Admirals Winnefeld and Davidson, but they obviously heard I was going to speak, so they're not here today. But I'm glad Admiral Mackey didn't get that word because he's sitting right there. Thanks, sir, for being here. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Admiral Daly and uh, General uh, uh, Bob Shea, um, our uh, fellow flag and general officers, uh, senior enlisted leaders, and distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. It's my distinct honor to be back here uh, in America's finest city to again address this incredible group uh, and our industry partners, Patriots All. Thanks so much to USNI uh, and FCA. I'm a proud member of both for hosting this event and for challenging all of us to think about the vital nexus between emerging technology and military operations. I tried to meet this challenge in 2014 when I last addressed this audience by wearing Google Glass and manhandling an iPad. That same year, I also addressed AFSEA in Hawaii, where a drone brought me my speech and a robot brought me a bottle of water. But this year, instead of bringing you the next gizmo, I'm bringing you a message. I need your help. I'd like you to think back to the night of September 11, 2001, when President Bush addressed the nation 
And he said, America was targeted for attack because we are the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world. No one will keep that light from shining. Ladies and gentlemen, to ensure America's beacon of light continues to shine, even to the farthest and the darkest corners of the world, we must continue to develop the innovative capabilities that allow good to overcome evil. Our country must maintain credible combat power in concert with like-minded allies and partners to preserve unimpeded access to all the shared domains, sea, air, land, space, and cyber. And the time to act is now, for I believe we're approaching an inflection point in history. We're certainly not approaching anything resembling the end of history. Freedom, justice, and a rules-based international order hang in the balance. And the scale won't tip of its own accord or simply because good people wish it so. What I'm talking about is perhaps a daunting, brave leap of exponential thought and development on how we do business as a military. In a network world that's changing dramatically, we must craft methods of war fighting that link our hard power technology, our smart power capability, and our rock solid commitment to security with our allies and partners. And nowhere is this more urgently needed than in the Indo-Asia Pacific, a region which I believe is inextricably linked to America's future prosperity and security. Ensuring stability in this region is a team sport where PACOM and all of you play a huge role. Our opportunities out here are abundant, but the path is burdened by four considerable challenges, North Korea, China, Russia, and ISIS. In the here and now, ISIS is a threat that must be destroyed. The main focus of our coalition's military effort, and rightfully so, is on the Middle East and North Africa. But as we eliminate ISIS in those areas, some of the surviving fighters will likely repatriate to their home countries in the Indo-Asia Pacific. And what's worse is they'll be radicalized and weaponized. So we must eradicate this disease before it metastasizes in the PACOM area of responsibility. But ISIS isn't our only immediate, immediate threat in the region. North Korea distinguishes itself as the only nation to have tested nuclear weapons in this century. As former U.S. Secretary of Defense Bill Perry once said, we have to deal with North Korea as it is, not as we wish it would be. Now, I want you all, I want all of you smart people to stop and think for a minute, minute and really think about this. Combining nuclear warheads with ballistic missile technologies in the hands of a volatile leader like Kim Jong-un is a recipe for disaster. That's North Korea as it is. Now, I know there's some debate out there about the miniaturization and other technological advances made by Pyongyang, but an aggressive weapons test schedule, as demonstrated by yet another ballistic missile launch earlier this month, moves North Korea closer to its stated goals. I must assume that Kim Jong-un, his claims are true. I know his aspirations certainly are. So I take him at his word. And that should provide all of us a sense of urgency to ensure PACOM is prepared to fight tonight with the best technology of any force on the planet. Vicious, vindictive, and volatile dictators are nothing new in the long, dark history of mankind. But what is new is a vicious, volatile, and vindictive dictator with his fingers on a nuclear trigger. This is why we must remain ever vigilant in our efforts to defend the U.S. homeland and the homelands of our allies in South Korea and Japan. This is why we need technologies like THAAD and the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter to be operationalized in Northeast Asia. We're also challenged in the Indo-Asia Pacific by revanchist Russia and an increasingly assertive China, neither of whom seem to respect the very international agreements they've signed on for. Both Moscow and Beijing have choices to make. They can choose to disregard the rules-based 
security order that has served all nations, including them, so well for decades, or they can contribute to it as responsible stakeholders. I hope for the latter, but I have to be prepared for the former. No one, including me, wants conflict. I've said often that I prefer cooperation so that we can collectively address our shared security challenges. But I've also been loud and clear that we won't allow the shared domains to be closed down unilaterally. I've said this before, but it's worth repeating now. We'll cooperate where we can, but we will be ready to confront where we must. So where does science and technology come in? I'll start by telling you where it doesn't. Simply adding legacy systems to new platforms isn't going to cut it, and neither will evolutionary improvements to legacy systems. Industry is full of examples of how linear thinking can kill an organization. For instance, consider the famous fight between Fujifilm and Kodak. Both companies were aware of the coming digital age as consumers began to alter their choices in photographic or wet film marketplaces. Fujifilm was brave enough to think with a future in mind about how to maintain the culture of photography and not just the medium of photography. Fujifilm also diversified in the new lines of business that would become important in the digital age, like healthcare and document solutions, imaging technology, and all of that. What film wasn't their future? Meanwhile, the Kodak behemoth was slow to change and was hesitant to meaningfully divest itself from the dying wet film business. And Kodak filed for bankruptcy in 2012 while Fujifilm thrived. So linear thinking is just business as usual. It doesn't take into account a read on the future. The weight behind the phrase, it's the way we've always done it, is too great a lift for many. Linear thinking gets you a better camera and, better, and maybe a better way to develop wet film. Exponential thinking gets you Snapchat and Instagram. Or said another way, linear thinking gets you a better buggy and maybe even a faster horse. But exponential thinking gets you an electric supercar that might drive itself. Folks, we have to change the way we do business and the way we think. Change is difficult and uncomfortable. And I get it that different audiences listen to my remarks, might interpret my signaling with their own interests in mind. For, for instance, you engineers and acquisition types will hear this message and think the PACOM commander is tired of the same old stuff. He's demanding innovative weapon systems with more lethality. You'd be right. Allied and partner nations will hear this message and hopefully be reassured that the U.S. commitment to the Indo-Asia Pacific is as strong as ever, and America is looking at new ways to maintain the rules-based security order, and they'd be right. And potential adversaries, upon hearing this message, should recognize that their propagandized attempts to sell America's decline is a bunch of hooey. The United States is going to remain a powerful leader in the Indo-Asia Pacific, and as demonstrated by San Diego's own USS Carl Vinson, Carrier Strike Group patrolling the South China Sea today, our joint forces will continue a robust and persistent presence in the region, just as we routinely have for over seven decades. So that no one thinks that I'm a starry-eyed optimist, it's important to, to everyone to know that I look through a lens darkly. Hope is not a strategy, and that's why everyone in this room must act now. Linear thinking simply won't keep us in front of the strategic challenges that we face as a nation. We need to think exponentially to make the kinds of leaps that will keep America as a preeminent global military power. Trends in computing power are leading to what Ray Kurzweil has called the singularity, which is the point at which machine intelligence surpasses that of humans. Kurzweil, no stranger to this audience, I'm sure, has been more right than wrong in his predictions about the state of technology. In fact, he revised an earlier prediction of reaching the singularity in 2045 to happen as early as 2029. Folks, that's just a little bit more than a decade from now. And with how fast technology is moving, 
it wouldn't surprise me if Crutchwell revises his prediction to an even earlier date. So we need to think exponentially just to keep up. We must take advantage of cutting-edge technologies to outpace our adversaries. We must make real efforts to reap real advantages in artificial intelligence, or AI, and collaboration between people and computers, also known as man-machine teaming. Third offset, anyone? AI and man-machine teaming are promising areas of research and development that I'm sure interest most people in this audience. Now, I'm a simple analog guy from Tennessee. When I think of man-machine teaming, I think of a pickup truck hauling corn to make moonshine. And try as you may, you cannot digitize good moonshine. But let's explore this concept a bit further for my sake, if not for yours. Time is the great ally and the great enemy. AI and man-machine teams take advantage of autonomy to ultimately inject more time back in the human decision cycle, to make time our ally and, and to make time our enemy's enemy. And the technology is mature enough to do it now. This isn't theoretical stuff anymore. To prove my point, let's talk about drones. The smartest guy in the Pentagon, well, besides Secretary Mattis, of course, is arguably Dr. Will Roper. Many of you have seen him recently on 60 Minutes snooping around your labs looking for great ideas. He and his team are changing the game and changing it fast. His swarms of 3D printed micro drones, or PERDIX, provide our aircraft with an autonomous search capability to identify threats and hazardous areas. This transfers the risk from our operators and our expensive aircraft to a bunch of inexpensive drones. Another example occurred in this year's Super Bowl. If any of you watched the halftime show on TV, you saw 300 quadcopters put on a light show as an opening act for Lady Gaga, who was terrific, by the way. If Fox Sports can do that to entertain millions, then we can do the same kind of network thinking to bring extra lethality to the battlefield. What interests me in these examples are not the drones per se, or even Lady Gaga for that matter. What interests me is the network that allows 100 drones or more to fly in formation, to receive new orders, and to report back. That said, there's a dark side, as Jan Tai and Mike Gilday know all too well. As soon as we figure out how to do this, someone else will try to hack into it. I go back to my opening line. I need your help. Dr. Roper is also working with the Navy on its ghost fleet concept, where unmanned and autonomous systems in the surface, air, and, and undersea domains work together and with legacy platforms to conduct a number of relevant missions. This will only grow as we can take advantage of the exponential nature of the growth and learning we're experiencing in this area. This is important because I think that the multi-domain battle and cross-domain fires concepts are the right approaches we need uh, to adopt in order to win future battles. As a PACOM commander, I'm proud of the work of all of our teammates in operations across all the domains, land, sea, air, space, and cyber in the vast Indo-Asia Pacific. As I've already told our outstanding U.S. Army Commander, General Bob Brown, before I leave PACOM, I'd like to see the Army's land forces conduct exercises to sink a ship in a complex environment where our joint and combined forces are operating in other domains. Moving forward, all the services will have to exert influence in non-traditional and sometimes unfamiliar domains. More change, more angst, more opportunity. We must be able to execute joint operations across far, far more domains than our operational planners accounted for in the past. We need a degree of jointness where no domain has a fixed advantage or a fixed boundary. A combatant commander must be able to create effects from a single domain to targets in every domain in order to fight tonight and win. And that's not all. I'd like to see the services use autonomous technologies to help the Joint Force Commander expand the kill chain. For example, I believe that Army Missileers should incorporate their air defense systems into the Navy's Integrated Fire Control Counter Air or NIFCA architecture. I've called for anti-ship missiles that are faster, 
longer range, more lethal, networked, and cheap. Now, if those five attributes are mutually exclusive, how about a family of missiles that together has all of those characteristics? To this end, I put your money where my mouth is and established a multi-domain Tiger team at Paycom. Though my mouth is probably bigger than your wallet, I think this is juice worth the squeeze. So my component commanders can expect to see an exercise order from me later this year. As Admiral Wayne E. Meyer famously said, we're going to build a little, test a little, and learn a lot. Some might think that these are lofty goals, but I don't. I think they're achievable goals. Put another way, innovate or die. The way we think about war and how we conduct it is quickly changing. I think most of you in this room will agree with me when I tell you that the most frustrating part of change is that some of the biggest obstacles we have to overcome are those that we impose on ourselves. In the vernacular, we need to stop shooting ourselves in the foot. One example of unnecessary restrictions include cyber capabilities and the appropriate authorities needed to use them. You've all seen the headlines, cyber capabilities exceed authorities. I read that to mean that we can't use the tools that we've developed. And I'm sure that some of the developers of those tools that are in this room are wondering why they even bother to continue their innovative work if we can't use it. Linear thinking, when applied to strategy and doctrine, is especially dangerous because it can hamstring exponential thinking and weapons development. For example, we face significant cruise and ballistic missile threats in the Indo-Asia Pacific. We've already talked about North Korea. China is free to field a complete arsenal of highly capable advanced land-based and a ship missiles while we're restricted from fielding the kind of conventional weapons we must have to stay ahead of them. And as, and as, many, and as probably many of you read earlier this week, Russia deployed a new cruise missile that violates the INF Treaty. So let's apply exponential thinking to figure out what it takes for America to feel the type of systems to enable joint forces to realize the full potential of the multi-domain battle and cross-domain fires concepts, while importantly adhering to our international treaty obligations. Or if we're not going to get exponentially smart, let's at least get better lawyers. So as I said back in 2015, when I testified before Congress, I always prefer to bring a gun to a knife fight. But as it stands today, I might get shot before I even get to the fight. I can't ask you to build something that we can't use. But we, but we can't have game-changing, we can't leave game-changing technology on the shelf because of restrictions on sensible security measures. All right, so I know I've been up here for some time now. Hopefully I've given each of you something to think about. I'll wrap this up with a challenge and a call to action before Siri tells me it's time to take a few questions. I firmly believe that America is still the center of gravity for innovation. If you don't believe me, just look at the one million plus international students studying in our country last year, 31% of which, or over 300,000, are Chinese. And that's a five-fold increase from only a decade ago when Chinese scholars who study here accounted for just a little over 10% of international students. And my gut tells me that they're not studying English literature. They're undoubtedly studying the hard sciences, engineering, computer science, and other courses to help them become innovative thinkers. So it's imperative that America uses our inherent innovative spirit to start thinking exponentially. Thus, my challenge to all of you is simple. Don't be passive and don't do nothing. Folks, whatever the future may yield, it's up to us to bring it to fruition. And I use us generally, it's really up to you, America's industrial and technological base. Technology can provide us the means to do things in ways that save time, saves dollars, improves collaboration with our allies and partners, and decreases risk across the board. But we have to be willing to break paradigms. Exponential thinking will take us to the next level. We need our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Coast Guardsmen, Marines, and our civilian teammates to, find, to continue to field and find new ways to apply that technology. 
And we need to get rid of self-imposed restrictions that allow us to create organizations that are agile and unafraid to push the envelope uh, on new innovations that we can use when we have to fight tonight. Now, I've given you my challenge, and here's my call to action. Fate rarely calls upon us at a moment of our choosing. Think about that. Fate rarely calls upon us at a moment of our choosing. That's pretty cool words. That's a line from Transformers 3. So if you remember nothing else, just remember that you were at West 2017 when the PACOM commander stole a line from Optimus Prime. Ladies and gentlemen, the strength of our nation depends on the very synergy between those brave men and women of our armed forces who volunteered to defend our country and the inventive engineers, acquisition experts, and partners in industry who come up with the technologies we need in the warfighting environment. You have my personal gratitude for all you do on a daily basis to give your military the tools we need to ensure our nation maintains its competitive edge. May God bless this beautiful city by the sea. May God bless our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and DOD civilians who carry the load for us with the stuff you give them. And may God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I've got a few minutes uh, for questions, I believe, and I'll be happy to take them. I'll ask the media, if there's any in the audience, not to ask me any questions, because I'll have a separate session with you all uh, after this. So we'll, we'll give the, the members and the, and the acquisition folks and the innovators and the inventors and all that opportunity to ask some questions, please. Great talk. So Thank you. Did, did your subordinates get the memo? They did. Because I, I, think, I think Bob Brown, General Bob Brown, uh, Admiral Not So Swift, he's, uh, he's a lot more swifter than that, but Admiral Not So Swift and Shags uh, O'Shaughnessy and, and uh, Dave Berger um, and all those folks, they are with it. They get it. And, uh, you know, I have to hold them back sometimes. Okay. All right. Well, this is like a long walk. Okay. We ought to be able to do this a little easier. This is the 21st century. So. Sir, hello. My name is Doug Nadel, and I'm with MAPR. Thank you're, you for your, you're with whom? MAPR. Thank you for your service, sir. And thank you for that wonderful speech. I think we're all going to remember this for a long time. <laughs> um, simple question is, um, you know, how can uh, industry take these innovative technologies to you and your organization so that it can be looked at in real time. As you know, innovation happens every day. What we'd like to be able to do is to make sure that you have visibility to that, sir. Yeah. And so uh, I've got a, a great uh, J8, uh, Dr. George uh, Callaway, Dr. K. And he spends a huge chunk of his time uh, uh, meeting with uh, industry partners. Uh, I've got a, a great science advisor, which is uh, in Dr. K's organization, uh, who's putting on, uh, I think in May, uh, th this uh, PACOM uh, science uh, fair kind of a th thing, uh, which, which is an opportunity for industry uh, to come to Hawaii uh, and talk to uh, PACOM and the components. Uh, PAC Fleet, uh, Admiral Swift and his science advisor uh, put on a pretty great industry show last fall. So these are all uh, opportunities for industry to come out to the combatant command, PACOM in my case, but to all the combatant commands, and to show us what you've got. But at the end of the day, you know, my wallet really is small. You know, uh, the combatant commanders don't buy stuff except in, in uh, specialized areas for, for certain uh, 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 things. 
but you know you have to at the end of the day uh, pitch it to the services and the acquisition folks on the on the various service secretariats uh, and OSD. But the combatant commanders can help pull, but you have to push. Absolutely. But I, I encourage you to take advantage of these uh, 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 industry uh, fairs uh, that we that we have in Hawaii. There's, there's uh, the big one coming up here in May. Sure, and in the IT side, you know, experts have said that 75% of the budget goes towards maintaining legacy systems. It'd be great to just see a percentage of that go back to innovation, but I think you already recognize that. Yeah, I, I think that you know, uh, uh, at at Paycom we ride on a uh, on an engine back backbone, and they're 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 pretty innovative, uh, uh, I, I believe, with what they're doing. But you know, we we have to uh, uh, be sensitive. Uh, to the cyber threats we have. And, and so that's going to appear to be uh, um, ha a hamstring, I think, by industry. But if we get too far out in front of, uh, of where we are in terms of being able to defend our networks, and then we're going to find ourselves uh, vulnerable. So there has to be that, that balance, I think, between network freedom on one hand and cybersecurity on the other. Thank you. Did I say that all right, Jan? OK, great. Oh, good. Just want to make sure. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. I'm not here to correct that at all, sir. All right. Now, um, my question in, in your dealing with our international partners, as we talk about moving faster, innovating, modifying the way that we fight, how are your um, dealings with the partners that we expect to fight with, how does that go? How do we bring them along on the journey um, in a way that's meaningful and we can continue to work together? Yeah, so that, that's a great question, and, it, and I'll, I'll try to answer it by, I'll try to begin to answer it by describing the, the partner coalition and allied environment in the Pacific. So the United States has only five bilateral treaty allies in the whole world, but five bilateral defense treaty allies. They're all in the Indo-Asia Pacific. So that's one set of partners uh, that we deal with uh, uh, differently than, than we deal with uh, others because these are allies that we're bound by treaty to defend in one form or fashion depending on the treaty. And then we have our Five Eyes partners of which uh, most are in the Indo-Asia Pacific with the, with the exception of, of the UK, though you can argue, arguably say that, that uh, Diego Garcia is, is part of that. Uh, and then we have some NATO partners that are in the Pacific as well, right? Even though NATO is itself not in, in the Pacific and, and France comes to mind there. So we have these allied structures uh, in the Indo-Asia Pacific. Then we have our close partners, partners like Singapore. You know, we couldn't do what we do without the help uh, from Singapore. Uh, and we have the opportunity I believe with India, a growing uh, uh, relationship across the board, strategically, militarily, uh, industrially, in intellectually, culturally, the whole thing. Uh, v Vietnam is another country that, that, we're, that we're, we're, we're having a closer relationship with. So these, these uh, relationships that we have with these countries uh, form the backbone, I guess, of where we are with technology. And, and I, I'll tell you that, you know, the American technology is, is the best in the world. Uh, and we have to balance uh, uh, the technology we share with our friends, allies, and partners, especially in the cyber realm, with security and all the things that you're expert in, and, and Mike Yilday and uh, Mike Rogers uh, and, and all those folks are concerned about. And then on the other hand, uh, you know, you have the hard, hard stuff, right, JSF. Uh, ships, uh, harpoon, you know, all the different systems that we have, which, which might be uh, more expensive than some of our, 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 our partners might be able to afford, or we might put strings on them, end use technology and things like that for all the right reasons, which may cause them to, to have a sovereignty issue with it, and they might turn instead to a, c a competitor company. When I say competitor company, I mean a company that's not American. You know, maybe a Russian company or maybe a Chinese company. So we have to balance all that. Uh, and, uh, you know, PACOM plays a role in that balancing. Uh, and there are different entities that we're 
a part of uh, in the interagency that we, we can get at some of these issues. Uh, but we have to, at the end of the day, it's, it's like the cyber comment earlier, you know, we're trying to balance security with trade, uh, commerce, and, and uh, 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 being a good uh, ally, friend, or partner. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for your very uh, enlightening speech, uh, and thank you for your service. I, a side note, I grew up in Rochester, New York. Your comparison to Eastman Kodak, George Eastman was an exponential right. thinker, and I'm sure he's turning in his grave at what happened to his company. Along the lines of exponential thinking. Uh, well, you know, Kodak actually invented the digital camera. Oh, I know all the history of this, so, believe me, <laughs> very yeah. intimately. Um, but a good analogy. Along the lines of exponential thinking, being a small business myself and uh, involved with, uh, in small ways, defense contract work, I would ex issue a challenge to you, sir, if you can, I'm sure you have greater degree of influence than I do, in looking at FAR and DOD acquisition and the myriad yellow page about this thick of contract vehicles and upending that whole process because I believe it stifles innovation yeah. and it uh, certainly causes the best technology not to necessarily rise to the top. Uh, I would submit to you that if the Manhattan Project operated under current FAR rules, we'd still be developing the nuclear weapon. Yeah. I'll take my answer seated uh, down. So, so you give me a couple of things to think about. Uh, I'll, I'll just make a comment that Leslie Groves, uh, the, the guy who was given the task of building uh, the atomic bomb, was uh, given un unconstrained uh, resources and total authority. And, and I submit to you that we're never going to see that combination of, of unlimited resources and unlimited authority in any one person or organization uh, again, probably for the right reason. That said, uh, I, I understand where you're coming from, but I, I'm not the person that's going to carry that water for you. You know, I've got enough challenges to get through each day with, 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 with something intact, uh, and that's in the operational world. Uh, but that message is, is an important message that I think you should carry uh, to our uh, leadership uh, in Washington uh, about the stifling nature of acquisition uh, and, and all of that. Okay, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Admiral, thank you for your inspirational remarks. And uh, you can't get out of here without a Naval Institute Press book with an appropriate FC, a bookmark. This book is China's Quest for Great Power by Bud Cole. Thank you, sir, for giving us your precious time today.